Welcome to this Gillick Explains Finance video. This week, two vital words for investors, opportunity cost. Okay, so let's crack on. The bottom line is this, as humans, as investors, we tend to focus on and justify the decision we have made. And what's more, as I'll show in a moment, we tend to identify the obvious costs and not the less obvious or indirect costs. We ignore alternatives. In other words, we don't always weigh them up properly. I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. And that's the hidden opportunity cost of any decision. So to bring that down to earth, if you like, let's look at two situations where this is a danger. Two examples coming up. University, first of all. Now, it could be that you were weighing up once the cost of going to university and the benefits of going to university. Maybe your kids are trying to weigh this up. Make sure you factor in two aspects of it, not just one. So make sure you're weighing up the full cost of a degree against not doing a degree. Now, what do I mean by that? A lot of people will identify the cash costs, if you like. They'll say, oh, there are tuition fees and there are living costs and student loans only cover a certain proportion of those. So those are the things I need to factor in. When I'm looking over three or four years at a degree course. Those are the costs I need to identify. Those are the ones I need to weigh up. But what about the time you're investing over three to four years to do a degree? Could that time be spent doing an apprenticeship, for example, being employed, and if so, how much money have you not earned by doing a degree? And don't forget, if that's money that's going to go into your retirement funds eventually, you've missed out on the opportunity to compound it over that period as well. And that's what I mean by opportunity cost. I'm not saying, by the way, this should make you panic and say to your kids, don't go to university, but you do need to weigh up what I call the hard cash costs and the hidden cost, if you like, of investing three or four years of time. Now, to bring it close to home, looking at investing, for example, here's another one. You decide to keep your money in cash, all right? And you think, well, the reason is I'll generate a safe annual return of 1%, a positive return, banks are unlikely to go bust, great. However, what about the return you could have earned elsewhere? Now, in the short term, you might say that's peanuts and not worth the risk. But over the medium to long term, there's plenty of risk here and there's plenty of opportunity cost in this decision to stay in cash. How could I justify that statement? Well, we might be shortchanging ourselves here. How safe is cash? I've put this slide up in other presentations, but the purchasing power of 100 pounds, for example, between the mid 1970s and somewhere closer to today, has shrunk fairly dramatically according to that graph. Why? Inflation. So inflation erodes silently and persistently the spending power of cash, if you like. So 100 pounds in the top drawer might look the same, when you pull it out in 2016, 2017, but it would have bought a lot less. In fact, 100 pounds would have bought just under 10 pounds worth of goods and services rolling forward over that length of time. So there's the danger, all right? Now, the opportunity cost is this, because that cash could have been somewhere else. Where else? Well, for example, if you look at the Barclays Equity Guilt Study, you will see that they reckon, while the past is no guide or guarantee of future performance, that shares over that period, offered around 5.5% annually on a real basis. Government IOUs managed just shy of 3%, and cash just over 1%. So there's the point. Yes, you're earning a sort of positive, small, real return in cash over that period, but it's almost like, let's see what you could have won. You might have got something, something, you know, there's no charges factored in here, but closer to that. So you are missing out on something potentially over that period. Now, you might say, well, no one can guarantee the performance of shares. True, but this does paint an interesting picture about the cost of staying in cash. Now, how risky are shares in that context? Good question. Uh, again, similar sort of data, but presented in a slightly different way. If you were to look at a starting point, shows an arbitrary figure of here of, say, £25,000 back in the early 1970s, just ahead of one of the worst bear markets for shares we've ever seen, you'll see that what happens is in real terms, the value of shares plunges quite fast, all right? But even taking that massive bear market into account, in real inflation-adjusted terms, there's your sort of trend line for shares, if you like, and there's a fairly clear trend line for cash returns on an RPI-adjusted basis. So what are we saying? We're saying sitting in cash carries this opportunity cost in the form of lost purchasing power. Shares are volatile. You can see that. The red line goes all over the place, but the trend is broadly speaking upwards. And actually, the all share has not just maintained your purchasing power over the period in question, it's actually sort of increased it if you carry that line across all the way from left to right. And that's important. Now, an investing framework, you might be saying, well, how do I put all this together? When cash, when shares, when something else? Well, 
There's lots more I could say about this, but here's a broad framework. Food for thought. Short-term rainy day funds. That's to cover emergencies, the leaky roof, being fired, for example. Yes, mainly cash. Medium-term milestones. Private school fees coming up, for example. Second car to, to fund, maybe a second property if you're really lucky. That needs to be mainly in something like IOUs. All right? Not maybe in cash, but definitely not necessarily in shares. In shares, you want what are called your lifetime savings. So this is stuff you can commit to the market for a decent period of time, all right? And chances are, or well, the past is no guide to the future, you will find you'll generate a higher annual real return over the long term than you do in those two other asset classes. So it's a case of dividing up, basically, your funds according to your requirements and objectives and risk tolerance. As I say, lots more we could say about that. And if you're investing in shares, don't forget the rules. Otherwise, this framework goes out of the window. We're not going to panic sell when the market drops, and we're not going to put ourselves in a position where we have to sell shares to meet a short-term call on capital, as I call it. So, more about those in other videos. In conclusion then, every financial decision should factor in the costs and benefits. And the point is, don't just focus on the obvious costs, make sure you've got the opportunity costs in there too. Give you a couple of examples. And that means that all investment decisions are in effect active. So, make sure that opportunity cost features from now on in any investment decision that you take. Any questions about some of the things I've talked about, a lot of ground covered there, editor at killick.com. And if you'd like to expand on some of the ideas that I've summarised in this video, our comprehensive library is at killick.com forward slash learn.